The following podcast is a presentation of Project I Radio 24 7 Nergasm. <laughs> No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f- Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project I Radio. I am your host, Brian Keene. With me in the studio, his grand return, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave, Meteor Notes Thomas. Yeah, yes, I'm back, and uh, I, I'm sure you've noticed that the uh, fall weather has arrived. The fall weather has arrived. Which means, that, of course, that the meth heads will be changing into their fall camouflage. They, they will, know. and we have the windows open to enjoy the fall weather. So uh, The fall meth head yelling. I'm, so. sure, I'm sure the meth heads will make an appearance this episode. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Influence of Anxiety, Lovecraft, Block, Barlow, etc. All, which is a new exhibit at Brown University's John Hay Library in Providence, Rhode Island. This exhibition focuses on correspondence between H.P. Lovecraft and a number of budding young authors, including Robert Block. Their recorded communication is both visual and literary, descriptive and didactic, lighthearted and severe. It illuminates the shared affinities and fears of those in Lovecraft's circle. Uh, the exhibit runs from now until January 8th of next year, and for more information, you can visit library.brown.edu. And I would like to point out, Dave and I uh, had an opportunity to to glimpse a preview of this exhibit uh, before it was shown to the public. Uh, we saw some of the artifacts that are going to be included. If you're a, an H.P. Lovecraft fan or a Robert Block fan or just a, a fan of the genre, uh, it is well worth taking a trip to Providence and checking Absolutely. this out. Absolutely. This was seriously one of the coolest things I've ever seen. We got to see it this past summer. Um, highly recommend that you... Uh, you can check this out if you like. You said you like Lovecraft, you like horror, and uh, it's it's a really cool exhibition. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Now uh, later on in this episode, we have an interview with horror poet and writer Linda Addison, who has the distinction of being the first African American to ever win a Bram Stoker Award. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but before we get to that, Dave, I I noticed. Uh, a critique online of the show this week. Yes, uh, they said that we're too funny. Yes, and yes. that I laugh yeah, I I need to stop being Howard Stern, and you yes. need to stop being Robin and laughing at yeah. everything I say. So yes, horror is very serious. Yes, yeah, so so we're gonna yeah, we're, we're gonna be very and, uh, yes, not laugh at The Walking Dead. Yes, because, we're no, that's impossible. We're, um, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're going to be very serious. Yes, this, be very serious. this is going to be the voice I'm going to use through the whole episode. And, I, of course, ignore pretty much any criticism I see because it's like YouTube. You never read the comments. So, Yes, I, I agree. Well, well, with that, Dave, welcome back from uh, yeah. Prague Power. Okay, the, yeah, we need to stop doing that, right? <laughs> Why, does that turn you on? No. no <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Wait, you got a hair on your microphone there, okay. cat hair. Oh, Max is like my new buddy. Yeah. He's, he like comes out and visits now when we, when we do the show and stuff, so he was just here. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just well, distracted during the show. It's because I'm petting the cat. <laughs> Welcome back from Prague Thank Power. You. You. Um, your trip to Wacken, the big heavy metal festival over in Europe, uh, we talked about that on the air. That did not go as planned. Tell me, was Prague Power any better? Oh, no. Prague Power was uh, much better than, uh, than Wacken. Um, this was number 16. It's the 15th year because the first year they did two of them uh, back in 2001. The first one was uh, held in uh, Chicago, and ever since then, number two on they uh, do the show in uh, Atlanta, 
So, uh, you know, I traveled down to Atlanta on Wednesday, and uh, there's a couple pre-shows, and then uh, Friday and Saturday is the, is the big event. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was great. Um, it's great every year. Um, I've been to every one but the third one. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a ton of fun this year. Uh, Ananthema was one of the headliners, one of my all-time favorite bands. And I'd never seen them live before, so that was exciting. And, um, yeah, there was a ton of great bands. Riverside played this year. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not. I don't think I've heard of them. I you've heard of them in my car. Um, Riverside is like a porcupine tree, Pink Floyd type band. Okay. Poland. Pretty sure you've probably heard them. Uh, so they played Falconer, a power metal band, played their last ever live show this year at Prog Power. No kidding. Yeah, they're done. Yeah, yeah. the last show, which is, you know, a really cool thing to uh, have there. And, um, She's trying to remember who else we saw. Uh, Royal Hunt played this year with their original vocalist DC Cooper, and they they uh, did a whole album. Anger played and uh, did their whole album, uh, Holy Land. Uh, they were the other headliner, Anger, and uh, there was a band from New England called uh, Native Construct that opened the show. Right. <laughs> you know, the really cool thing about them, they played very technical music. You know, it's it's metal, it's jazz, it's like it's very very challenging music they they look like they're about 12 like the guitar player is 17 years old no kidding yeah no they were goddamn amazing yeah, yeah i was just like how young are these guys what, <laughs> what, are, what are they called uh, they're called native construct native construct yes. yeah yes. I, I if you like very challenging progressive music i highly recommend their uh, their music it's it's not for the average person right <laughs> you know because it's, it's really complex and and stuff but it was a ton of fun you know we and sometimes we have listeners say well i like metal but i i don't know what dave means by progressive metal and i always you know i always point to the more mainstream progressive stuff like queens dream theater right. yeah um dream theater is, is the best example that you could use for a progressive progressive metal band they're kind of like the band that uh their album Images and Words, which came out in the nineties, is pretty much the album that launched that whole genre. Right. Genre, as I can yeah. tell speak. Um, there's been a couple there's probably for that. Obviously Queensryche early on, certainly not now. They're not progressive metal band anymore. Um, but a Queensryche Fate's Warning. Fate's you know, Warning. The early Fate's Warning stuff. So uh, yeah, but definitely like 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 you said, the Dream Theater is the band that uh, if you're thinking about the kind of music because this festival is pretty much it's either power metal bands or progressive metal bands and there's some of there. sometimes they have a you know a band that'll be like a more like a long lines of progressive wait wait band listen metal. listen oh i i hear a meth head outside <laughs> okay i'm sorry go ahead i don't i don't mean to, oh, to interrupt how dare i <laughs> um no it, it was uh, the festival was a ton of fun uh voyager also played this year they're from australia um they had recently been touring with a band called Evergrey, who uh, Evergrey and Voyager played the Wednesday night pre-show, and Voyager also played the main show this year. Uh, I highly recommend when they tour America the next time, people to go, because they're one of the greatest live bands you'll ever see. They are exceptionally entertaining on stage. I've seen them six times now. The show they put on at Prague Power is the best show I've seen them play yet. Um, it, it just, they're so entertaining live. And they're, they're also great studio bands, too, but live, they're just nuts. Yeah. They run on a stage. They're just crazy people. It, it was a ton of fun. So, um, yeah, so, there, I mean, it was a festival, and obviously, you've heard me talk on the show before, you know, my heart surgery last year almost died. So, a lot of these people go to the festival. Like I said, I've been every one but the third one, so there's a lot of people that go pretty much every year. So, it's like a family it's reunion. It's kind of a family reunion, a drunken family reunion, but a family reunion nonetheless. Um, so, a lot of people I only see there once a year. Right. So, I had a lot of attention this past weekend for people like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're okay. I'm so glad you're okay. And honestly, you know, I'm you know, sarcastic and evil and all that crap. It was really nice to hear this from all these people. I got so many hugs from hot girls. Um, it was delightful, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know. So uh, no, it was it was a ton of fun. The 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 guy who puts it on, it's uh, his name is Glenn Harveston. It's him and his wife Jen who run the festival, and it's I like I always say, it's the best music festival in the world. It's so well run. All the bands are always great. All the bands come and they put on a great show. Um, you might not like every band, but it's a music festival. Right. You're not like every band in the bill. You know, if there's a band playing I don't necessarily like, there's a taco place. That, right uh, that's time to go to the beer stand, well, you know? There's a taco place right on the street. It's like one of the best Mexican restaurants I've ever been to. I bet so, they, they do a ton of business it's, during it's, this. Yeah, it's called Sausalito's West Coast Grill, and the dude runs, called, his name's Ernesto, and Ernesto says that he loves what he calls the black shirts. Yeah. So obviously, the metal show so everybody has a black shirt on. So I remember the time he said that, I thought it was really funny. So we always say the black shirts are coming. Hey, yeah. what's up, man? What are you doing? Come here. You'll be on the radio? On the radio? Yeah, what, what you, you want to have to get high right now? No, I'm going to get some too. <laughs> All right, man, we're just saying hi. We heard you earlier. So, right. saw you strolling past. 
Oh, yeah, my boy was like, I played hooky this morning. He played hooky? Yeah, he played hooky this morning. Yeah? Because we're going to build a campsite, and his dad's like, well, I can't come get you till tonight. He's like, I didn't play hooky for nothing, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, party on. <laughs> there you have it, Dave, our show exclusive. <laughs> Is this, he, is this, he a, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. The meth head slide. This is why I live in Baltimore. Because obviously nothing like that happens in Baltimore. I, so, I so now your your yeah. your ex wife manages uh, a prog metal we're band. We're not allowed to talk about that. Oh, we're not allowed to talk no, about that. No, I was gonna right give him a free plug. No, not right now. Oh dear. No, no, it's just it's. We'll talk about it in another show. Okay. Yeah. They're you know I want to make sure things are okay. We can't even say their name. I'm not gonna say their name right now. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, we'll just talk about it. As well. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. The, the 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 interview with the meth head just threw everything off here. <laughs> oh, like we figured that was cool. Right the reason we're doing. <laughs> so people are like, well, he's, he, he's, he's talking he, about Prague Bauer, and then <laughs> random guy showed up. He come so that people at home understand what happened. He came strolling by, and he, he peeked in the window, and you know he. Obviously, wanted to know what we were doing in here, so <laughs> it was entertaining. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so anyway, you know, Park Bar, like I said, that uh, you know they've been, you know, been doing this show for uh, you know since two thousand one. Um, yeah. So the, I believe, and uh, you know, don't quote me on this, but there used to be a festival in Baltimore called Power Mad. I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and th this went on, I believe. I went 99 through 2000, but I think they had one in 98 as well, and maybe 2001, so I think that's the date, so I don't really remember. Anyway, because at that point, I lived in San Francisco. Right. So I used to fly here to, to see this festival, because back then, hardly anybody was doing anything like this, and um, it was a disorganized disaster of unparalleled proportions. We used to have to sit there and look at the official show t-shirt to try to figure out what bands were on stage. Right. You know, things like that. Um, but we had a good time, and I know that one of the people that came to the Power Mad was Glenn Harveston. And, of course, everybody at Power Mad is like, I could put on a better production. Well, I think he's the only one that ever actually tried to do it, and it succeeded, to me, well beyond what anybody ever could possibly do. It is the best music festival I've ever been, bar none. Uh, it's one of the few that survived for a while. There was a lot of these in a, a different festivals all over the U.S. Yeah. Now they're virtually done, you know. Well, Props to Glenn, then. Yeah, no, he's, he's great. And his wife, Jen, is like does all the social media stuff, among many other things. And honestly, God, if anybody wants to see a case study of how to do social media right, look at how they do it. Yeah. Because she is a social media genius. We should have them on the show. Um, I mean, this is not their target audience, no, but we have, you know, we have, uh, well, we have listeners the listeners in the five digits, um, you know. And We're by down in Georgia, so that's you know our thing about having to have people with us. So. Well, yeah, that's a, it's kind of a drive. For be a road trip. I mean, well, we'll get to that in a minute because I, I have something to, to suggest to you in a bit. Okay. So, uh, like I said, it, you know, it's the bands come in, they play shows, they do a lot of times do special shows. For example, this year Voyager had the fans pick the set list. Right. So we all voted on what songs we want to hear and play during their show. Uh, bands will do full albums. They'll do classic albums. You know, classic lineups. I think Brian just left i don't know where he went no i'm here oh there he is <laughs> i'm here I'm, I'm locking the door oh <laughs> the, yeah that's probably the, more of them are gathering out there yes. hey yo they doing a radio show yeah. <laughs> exactly good lord this, All right. this is quite the neighborhood uh, um so yeah so you know it was a great time i saw a lot of people i know a lot of people were really nice to me this weekend i you thank you all for uh you know, say nice things to me. I'm glad I'm alive too. Trust me. So and then the other thing they do, of course, is they announce the lineup for next year. Yeah. So check this out because this is quite the lineup. So Friday night is uh, I'm going to read an order from open to close. It'll be Ascendia, and then Vanishing Point from Australia, uh, Freedom Call, uh, The Gentle Storm, which is a band that feed, that uh, is put together by a guy named uh, Arjun Lucasen, who's from a has done a ton of projects, mainly done this for a band called Arion, which I'm sure you've heard of my car. Right. And uh, and I know I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, but it's uh, Anneke von Giesenberger, and uh, she's the singer. She used to be in a band called The Gathering, which again, I know you've heard of my car. The Gathering to me recorded the greatest 
female friend of male album both. I have the gathering of my iPod. Yeah. Aren't yeah, you I, impressed? You are, because I know you heard him in my car. So <laughs> I introduced him to you. Uh, but anyway, that, so that band's playing Scar Symmetry. And then the headliner Friday night is Fate's Warning. Oh! But not only is it Fate's Warning, it's the original lineup of Fate's Warning. No it's shit! John Arch, and they're playing all of Awaken the Guardian for the 30th anniversary. Well, I guess I'm going to Prog Power right. next year. Well, then. that's good, because I was about to ask you that in a few minutes. But hey, that's just Friday. Then Saturday, we have Savage Messiah, Sirius Black, Green Carnation. Now, you may or may not have heard of Green Carnation. They recorded this album called Light of Day, Day of Darkness. Right. In the early 2000s, which is a great progressive sort of deathy sort of album. They're playing the whole thing in you know, the whole album. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so in its that, entirety. Yes, in its entirety. So that's going to be amazing. Uh, Refuge, Hawken. Uh, you probably have not heard of Hawken, but you like Dream Theater and other progressive bands. You would love Hawken. I know Hawken, the the smokeless tobacco, no, the no, dip. That's not this. No, it's okay. Okay, and then the headliner, and I cannot wait for this Devin Townsend project. No shit. Yes, with Anarchy. No she's shit. Selling a lot of his yeah. Albums, so she's playing with her band, and then she's going to sing with Devin Saturday night. Now I, I'm putting this out to you right now, Brian. Will you commit to going to Pride Power next year? Uh, as long as it doesn't interfere with anything going on with my little guy, okay. yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, he's in Cub Scouts now, right. so you know if we have a well September 9th and 10th, Pine Box Derby uh, Championship that weekend. I, actually, but, I can understand because I want to see you building a Pine Box Derby car. <laughs> that would be very entertaining. Thanks for brought that up. Yeah, because we need to videotape you. As Coop would say, fabricate. No, shit, I'll go just to see yeah. Fate's Warning alone. Yeah. You know. No, that's an, ama- is that yeah. not an amazing That's lineup? a great lineup. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of great bands. Um, the tickets go on sale October 3rd. I advise you, if you're even thinking of going, buy your tickets right away. It will sell out. Um, Where can people get tickets? Ticketmaster. Um, okay. So if you want to know more about this, I would suggest either going to the Prime Power USA website. Or the Facebook page. Honestly, I like the Facebook page because they do a great job of keeping updated with information about the show and all that stuff. Just go on Facebook, type in Prime Power USA, it'll take you right there. Um, you know, or just pro- go to Google, type in Prime Power USA, you get the official website. Um, I can't say enough good things about this festival. It is the I always say every year is the most fun I have. You know, yeah. During the year, also exciting for next year. Phoebe is going to make her first appearance. So not I won't be the only prog. Uh, Prog Power Virgin. No, there's always new people. Okay. I'm trying to get uh, Jessica yeah. and uh, Rachel to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, hopefully they'll go. I've already been yelling at them. Cool. Because they're like, oh, wow, this band's been like, you are going. Well, that's usually conducive to getting people to do things, yeah. yelling at them. Well, that's what everyone so. is to me. So I, I assume that's what <laughs> um, But yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what I did. I went to Prog Power and uh, had a great time. I, you know. I had a great weekend too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, had a date and uh, date. a date. Okay, anybody yeah. I know? Um, yeah, you know the person, but I'm not going to mention their name on the air because, uh, you know, we're we're trying to do this privately, and and also because it wasn't like a like a romantic date. It was just you know two friends hanging out on a date type okay, thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know who this is, but continue. But yeah, um, we're both uh, M Night Shyamalan fans. Um, <laughs> that's that's something that people won't admit to anymore. You know, <laughs> and for laughing. yeah, no, his, you know, his new movie was out, The Visit, um, and uh, I was looking for somebody to go see it with, and yeah, you're right, these days most people will not go see an M. Night Shyamalan film with you. And, and um, rightfully so, let's, let's, let's admit it, that he's not made Well, movie. hold on, hold on, I, I'll uh, get, I... I'm saying, I, I'm not talking about this movie, I'm not seeing it, but I'm saying his track record of late is not impressive. I defended him up until The Happening. Um, that was the one with the trees, right? Yeah, that was the one where the, the yeah. plants decide to kill everybody. <laughs> um, you know, I even I even liked, uh, you know, what was it, The Woman in the Water? Um, I thought The Village was great. That, that was the last one I liked. You know? After that, um, I never saw Lady in the Water. The tree one, I gave up. I yeah. watched it on TV, and about halfway through, I'm like, "This no." The the tree one did not work for me, and and you know that review is is in print if you want to go read it. Um, but you know, I've always defended the guy. I, I think he's a great filmmaker. Um, I, you know, I do. I think he relies on the twist, sure. But you know, that's his shtick. It's it's like 
yeah, every artist has those. Be they a writer or a filmmaker, you have your little tells, your little thing. You know, we've we talked in the Tom Piccarelli episode. Uh, you know, lots of things dealing with with fathers and sons. Everybody has stuff sure. like that. He's got the twist. Um, so yeah, this this friend and I, we we I drove uh, three and a half hours. And, wait, 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 three and a half hours? Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine who this person is that lives three and a half hours from here. Well, uh, it's a pretty wide geographical region, okay. Dave. We're we're right here in the Mid Atlantic, yeah. but uh, okay. it picked her up, and we went to the the we went to see the visit, and uh, we both enjoyed it. Um, it is a it is a return to form for M Night Shyamalan. Um, it's it's scary. Uh, it has a lot of heart. Um, it's a really clever, well done fascination of a young people's discomfort with old people, and and b the the fear older people have of of dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, it's it's really well done. Uh, it's also unexpectedly funny. This is what I heard about it, is that yeah. somebody said it's a very funny movie. Yeah, like, man, I didn't get that from the trailers at all. But yeah, no, it I, it was not marketed as a comedy, uh, but yeah, it's it's along the lines of you know Tucker and Dale versus Evil or. Shaun of the Dead or House, yeah. you know, it, it's it's a it's a horror comedy, absolutely balls out horror comedy. Tucker and Dale um, vs. Evil was one of those movies I never watched because I thought the trailer gave away the whole movie. Oh no, you need to watch it. Really? Yeah. Like, like the trailer doesn't the trailer show like every death in the movie, and I'm like, it, I don't need to see it, this now. No, it's still worth watching. Yeah, it, it's, I, it, I know it's on Netflix or something. For lines like these these teenagers keep throwing themselves into the wood chipper. <laughs> I mean, That's it's just you it, it, know, it's a fantastic film. Um, but yeah, the, no, the visit. If you, if you were a fan of of his, you know, like Sixth Sense, Unbreakable era, um, I I think this is a return okay. well, to that, to those. That's good news because I haven't been in movies in quite some time. Yeah. those movies are terrible. Now I'll warn you, it's a found footage film. Um, that, that doesn't bother. But see, even this, uh, my my date and I were discussing this afterward. Um, it's a found footage film ostensibly directed by this this 14 year old girl and her little brother okay and the way the camera is held the way the footage is shot it looks like it's being shot by a little brother and, and you know a 14 year old girl i mean it, it's shaky and it's not always in focus and uh no it, it's real good i figured out the twist beforehand and uh well, i mean that's you know yeah it's but like, the sixth sense i figured that out about a third of the way through the movie yeah but i still enjoy the movie exactly I, you know as long as the movie's entertaining you figure out what happens because most movies and, and tv shows i usually figure out what's happening before the end i just i think it's because i read a lot you know yeah and you write and read and i just think you know creative people were good at like I can't sit and watch something and just get stuck to it. I'm always like thinking, like, all right, what's going to happen here? I'm always trying to figure it out the plot I can't help myself. Right. So, but that, that doesn't bother me. As long as it's entertaining, we get there in an entertaining way. No, it was. It, it's a good film. I recommend it. So the trees don't kill people. The trees don't kill people. <laughs> yeah. Old people kill people in okay, this well, one. The only so. thing, I, I remember seeing the commercial on TV where the, the grandmother tells the, the girl to climb into the oven, which I, I just thought was hilarious. <laughs> 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 I'm just like, okay, I, I'm kind of sucked into this now. Um, of course, the question I always must ask, about any movie any animal deaths in it uh no okay so it's phoebe approved that yep we can go see it <laughs> yep yeah phoebe phoebe can handle this movie okay. yeah because we were talking about going to see it and i i said well i need to hear some reviews first because uh m night's recent output has not been too impressive so that's really good that he's maybe found his way again that's right so okay good you know it, it's worth noting i mean yeah. you know he's a homeboy he lives right here in central pennsylvania just like so many of the rest of us I do i always forget that but yeah he is from this area. um there are some there are some some incidental scenes when they go into town in the film and i'm like hey i know that place hey i know that place <laughs> yeah. so you know um so other news did you hear about Stephen King while you were at Prague Power? I, I did see this on the news, yes. That's right. It's a big deal. Stephen King was presented a National Medal of Arts in a ceremony at the White House. President Barack Obama, when awarding King with the medal, said, quote, One of the most popular and prolific writers of our time, Mr. King combines his remarkable storytelling with his sharp analysis of human nature. For decades, his works of horror, suspense, science fiction, and fantasy have terrified and delighted audiences around the world. End quote. 
Um, I would like to to point out. Now, I am I am not so much a fan of Barack Obama. I I, I think I'm on record with that. Uh, and and this is not the the Rush Limbaugh show nor the Rachel Maddow show. So we're we're not going to get into that. But uh, I was I was very pleased to hear Obama directly reference horror as a genre in in that quote um because you, you know working in this field we never get mentioned we, it's it's the you know the least mentioned genre ever unless somebody wants to make fun of writing yeah i mean you know like we talked about on the, the edward lee episode i mean cookbooks are more popular than exactly. than horror novels so it was I, regardless of your politics, whether you like Obama or not, whether you agree with Stephen King's politics or not, this is very good for the horror genre, and therefore it's very good for all of us. I mean, it's a national fucking medal of arts, you know. Um, pretty much the, the highest honor a, a, an author can get in this country. So, you know, I don't know. I thought it was way cool, and I, you That's know. That's cool. I mean, you know, I... I... I know I'll never be nominated for anything like this. So, <laughs> well, you might. Oh, we uh, we won we won three awards no, this last is true. weekend. This is true. I, see, I've never won anything, you know, other than I, I, the prodigious hairball award. I won that on a regular basis for my cats. But, um, <laughs> you yeah. know, no, we we've won our, our film that we made, Fast Zombie Suck. Right at the Imaginarium Film Festival, uh, we got we won best short, best genre short, and best screenplay. I. I Seriously, I saw this the other day. First of all, I didn't even know it was entered until, like, I, who entered it? I like. Uh, I think Lombardo, Lombardo did. Said, yeah. I assumed he did, but like, I had no idea it was entered. So I saw that the other day. That oh, hey, the movie's gonna be at a film festival. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then I saw this. I guess what Monday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got home and I'm like, holy crap! Like seriously, I am quite pleased with this. I guess, I'm serious. I've never won an award before. Which actually, after thinking about, it, that's not true. I won the attendance award when I graduated high school. Because I only just won the baseball. I only wish I had the health now that I had then. Well, because now I would not win the. I would win the. How often are you going to go to the emergency room award? Um, but no, this actually is like really cool. Yeah, I, I'm really happy we get we get real trophies and everything. I, I in fact, that was my first thought. I I got notified Sunday that we had won. But, you know, they hold off on announcing it till Monday. And uh, my first thought was, okay, we get three physical trophies, and there were seven of us involved in the making of this film. How the fuck are we going to divvy these up? So, what, wait, what was that? Quagmire. Quagmire, okay. That was a good quagmire. What radio station y'all doing that for? Oh, this is a podcast, brother. Podcast? Yeah, podcast. It's like, it's like radio, but it's on the internet. It's for iPods and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, iPods and stuff. Oh, that's neat. So, yep. Yeah, so, have a good day. All right, man. I'm going hunting this or hunting and camping this weekend, man. Cool. Well, have fun. I got my blue with me. The one that I got to see. I got my charge through the notch. Yeah? Yeah, and I'm paying it off. It's five a month. Man. All right. Don't get arrested. No. All right. Have You too. <laughs> We have lost control, Dave. <laughs> I just want to point out. Like, seriously. Like, I want to point out that uh, a red dude walking by and saying stuff into the window is more, co more, co more coherent, I like me, more coherent than anything with those nitwit three guys with beard yelled at us through the I just want to point this out. Sorry, I'm, I'm broken. I need a moment. <laughs> folks, a, folks at home. The, this is why I never hit the, the pause button. The, the plan this episode, would, you know, now obviously we've got a huge audience, but they're all they're all fans of the horror genre. They like horror films, horror novels, or, or maybe they make horror movies or horror novels. Um, but, you know, obviously we want to expand that audience. So... <clears throat> Our plan this week was Dave was going to talk about Prog Power, and then we were going to promote it to you know progressive metal fans and bring them in. Um, so this is going to be their their inaugural episode, and they're going to be listening, and and all of a sudden there's you know <laughs> drug addled teens doing quagmire impressions through the window. <laughs> oh my God! Philadelphia on one side, 
Pittsburgh on the other, Kentucky in the middle. Oh. As uh, Chuck Wendig said in one of his books. <laughs> one last bit of news, yeah. Dave. Well, no, I just, I, quick wrap, the, the whole award thing, I I just think it's really cool. I know you've won awards and stuff before, but like I said, it's, for the amount of work that we put into that movie, I, I'm very pleased with this. I'm not jaded with awards. Yeah, I have won some awards. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, to be honest, once they hand you the Grandmaster Award, um, or, you know, once a flag is flown in your honor over yeah, I mean that, over the military yeah. base in Afghanistan, <laughs> where the fuck else do you go? I mean, I guess I could get an Oscar. Um, I could get a National Medal of Arts like Stephen King. But but that being said, I'm not jaded. It's always, it's always nice to win an award. Well, I, um, I, you know, I'm very happy about this. I don't go out and lobby for them. No, I would but, never. But if I somebody wants to hand me that. one, yeah, it's, 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 it's a treat. It's an honor. Um especially with with fast zombies suck like like we said on that episode of the podcast the reason i i wanted to do this is because i wanted to to give the rest of you a showcase for your talents right. so the fact that that it is now winning multiple awards um tells me i did the right thing it tells me other people are recognizing you know all of your all's talents the same way i did so i think I, that's the I cool actually, part <laughs> i usually don't do this but i you know, won the award the other day, and I was, I linked to it, the, I put the thing on my Facebook page, and I linked to the movie again so people could see it, and I had not been to the page, and I think since we put it up, so I actually read the comments, which a lot of times on YouTube is a bad idea. Right. There's actually a lot of nice comments There's some page. great comments yeah. on there. And whoever the guy's opposed to, he gives it, he loved the Nine Inch Nails style intro, thank you. That wasn't really, I wasn't really channeling Nine Inch Nails when I was doing that, but I can see where you got that from. It is kind of a Nine Inch Nails sounding tune, so um, thanks for that. That I, I appreciate the comment, and um, yeah, it's really cool, and, and thanks to the Imaginarium people, and uh, hopefully we can get this in some more film festivals. Absolutely. Yeah, so. I hope so. All right, well, our final bit of news, Dave, before we get to our interview with Linda Addison, um, two of the absolute best writers of our generation i mean just absolute best from our generation mahita bell wilson and our very own co-host jeff cooper uh who's not here today both of them have new books coming out this fall uh coop's answers of silence is coming out in paperback and digital from deadite and bell wilson's last night at the blue alice is coming out from necro and I, I believe that will be I may be wrong on this, but I believe that's hardcover paperback I, and digital. Yeah, um, I think that's right. Yeah. Now, this is cause for celebration, and I know a lot of younger listeners are probably, like, they're probably aware that Coop writes, but they've never read him. Right. And they've probably heard of Bell, but never read her, and, and that's because both of them, they're very... They're very slow writers, and I don't mean that as a criticism. It Some writers are fast, some writers are slow. Um, you know... Coop, this is the first time in seven or eight years he's had something come out. And Belle, I think it might be a decade. I, her last collection was Dangerous Red. It's, it's I and, a long time. Yeah, yeah. I, so, so this is cause for celebration. Um, uh, so Coop's book is, is a paperback version of the, I think it was the Thunderstorm. The, the hardcover book that, that Jesus and I yeah. uh, put together. It, we wanted to publish Coop. And uh, he didn't want to write anything, though. And we said, okay, well, how about you write some story notes? Could you write some story notes? And he said, maybe. And, uh, yeah, Jesus and I spent a good four months uh, selecting which short stories to include. They, they cover his, you know, his 20-year career. And uh, Jesus wrote a great introduction for the book. And uh, Coop, true to his word, he, he wrote some new story notes. But, yeah, that was... Strictly a limited edition. Yeah, there's only like, what, 150 of those? 300. 300, 300 copies. Yeah, and there's not many. Right. Yeah. The, so, uh, so the odds of most of the people listening to the show having read that are very small. Yeah, now, you know Coop. Coop, yeah. the reason he, the main reason he he writes as little as he does is because he absolutely hates the fucking business. He hates the business. And uh, when Jeff Burke was here, when we had him uh, on the podcast, we had that little party afterward. And Jeff managed to corner Coop on the couch, and I don't know what he said. I don't know what kind of magic hoodoo he laid on Coop, <laughs> but by the end of the night, he had a he had a book deal to do that thing in paperback and digital. Well, that, that's right. I'm pretty sure Jeff is one of those people that could talk pretty much anybody into anything because he's just so energetic. 
you want to go along with whatever he says. I fucking love that kid. He's, he is, he's, but, he's amazing, and I, you know, hopefully I'm going to BizarreCon, and, and I would love to interview him again for the, the podcast because he's, he's I agree. To talk to. I agree. Um, but uh, that that's great, and uh, I have read that book. And it's amazing. Yep. And uh, you should all buy it. It's paperback, so like, it costs nothing. Absolutely. You know the the Jack Haringa episode, which uh, which just aired what yeah, a couple two weeks week, ago. two weeks ago. Yeah, I think so. You know, we we talked about extreme horror and how while Jack is not a fan of extreme horror, he loves Jack Ketchum. Um, I I would say if if you feel that way, if if you like Jack, if if you generally dislike extreme horror but you love jack ketchum that you you try both coop and mahitabelle wilson uh both of them are poets both of them use just the exact right words um i mean it, their stuff will make you flinch it, it, it'll make you it'll make you gasp yeah. but it's so beautiful the way they do it um so yeah I'm looking forward to both of those. I, I, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I have the Coop book, but I'll, I'll definitely buy the paperback anyway because I have passed the hardback round of evil. Yeah. Um, I know my ex-wife right now. She loves Coop's work. So yeah. She was very excited to read that, but I have the paperback. Uh, but uh, the, the Bell book, I'm very excited to read. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, um, so speaking of books, I just want to quick mention uh, that I, and this actually was before last week, but I was here last week, uh, I finished Head Full of Ghosts. Well, next week's episode, then, we need to debate We're that ending. We're going to uh, have a discussion about this coming up, and I'm going to tell people now, it is going to be spoiler-filled because you can't discuss this book without spoiling it. Exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to do our normal show like we do, and then after the end where we read the ad and, and, and say goodbye, then we're going to put at the end, at the very end of the episode our discussion of the book. So that way, if you've not read it, you can just turn the podcast off because you don't want to know anything about this book. I wouldn't even read The Dust Jacket before you read it. Right. You should just pick it up and just read it. Right. But I will say, and this doesn't spoil anything, best thing I've read in a year. Right. By oh, I, I agree. It's it's, it's the best book I've read this year. Unbelievably good. And, uh, you know, oh. Oh, we have we have another visitor, Dave. Uh, no. <laughs> can you pause that real quick? No, we can't pause, brother. This is live. Can I get a, thing up? Can I get a picture of water? My water is done. And I need to flush my toilet. Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Dave, you go ahead and stall. I have okay. to get him some water to flush his toilet. Okay. Um, so, yeah. No. <sighs> Only in central Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, so, yeah, like I was saying, uh, Head Full of Ghosts oh, fuck's is sake. absolutely amazing. And I don't think I even have a picture. Here. Oh, you got one? All right, hang on. This is live radio, folks. Here, give me a picture. Hold on. Dave, you got dead air there. Talk. Yeah, I'm listening to you. <laughs> uh, what happened to your cat? He ran. Uh, he was hanging out here. I got three fat cats. What did they do? Shut your water off? Shut my water off while I knew. My mom didn't even bother telling me about that bill she didn't pay last night. Yeah. See, so if you need a shower, I got a shower this morning. They shut it off early, about half hour after I got a shower. Well, at least you got a shower, right? Hell yeah. And now my boys in there dropping the deuce. <laughs> and I dropped the deuce. <laughs> I have no water to flush it down. Alright, here you go, dude. Thank you so much. No problem. Watch that lid's not on there, too. That's okay. Alright. No problem, man. So, there you have it, Dave. Yeah. His, his water was shut off. And okay. he needed a pitcher of water to yeah, I I flush the out, toilet. I need to rethink that option. I do want to point out to folks, um, I have a new novel coming out later this year called The Complex. It's about a bunch of people that live in an apartment complex in a low-income portion of central Pennsylvania. One of the characters is a writer. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the characters is a, a a drug adult teen uh -huh. um i just i want folks to think back to this episode when you're reading that novel <laughs> what does that come out is it like 2016 uh or? no uh the hardcover will be out uh this december oh okay and then the yeah the paperback and digital will be out early next year is that part of the upcoming uh, the hardcover will be part of this year's maelstrom yeah maelstrom. Okay. yeah um <laughs> but yeah, i 
I wasn't planning on talking about today, but I, I think it's one of the best things I've written in many years. Well, I have to say, I, I read, uh, I think, the, at least the first two chapters. Right. It's really good. Yeah. I, I'm really seriously, and I'm not saying this just because you know, I do this podcast with you, I seriously look forward to reading that. But yeah, yeah. You, the beginning was amazing. You just you just and, met one of the characters yes. in the novel. Yeah, and I believe Mike Lombardo once again gets killed in it. So he does? That's always, that's always an entertaining thing to read. So. I mean, you know... People think like that was staged. Like there, yeah. there can't really be all that chaos going on here. Yeah, twenty four seven, ladies and gentlemen. Can I borrow a pitcher of water <laughs> to flush my toilet? <laughs> all right. Well, this is why I own a house. That interruption was brought to you again by the influence of anxiety, Lovecraft block. Barlow, etc. All, which is a new exhibit at Brown University's John Hay Library in Providence, Rhode Island. This exhibition focuses on correspondence between H.P. Lovecraft and a number of budding young authors, including Robert Block of Psycho fame. Uh, for more information, visit library.brown.edu and find out about it. And now, Dave, let's go to the interview with Linda Addison and let's see what kind of chaos awaits us when we return. Okay, as always, and this is actually the last interview to, for Nikon that we have. Um, just remember, it was recorded in what area used to be a pool, so the sound might not be the best, and there's probably a really good chance that one of the nitwits from Three Guys of Beards will interrupt the show. So. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and our next guest is a poet and writer of horror, fantasy, and science fiction. She's not only a three-time Bram Stoker Award winner, four-time Bram Stoker Award winner, I'm being informed by Dave. Uh, I'm going to start over. She's not only a four-time Bram Stoker Award winner, but the first African-American to win the award. A founding member of the Sith Writing Group, her books include Animated Objects, Consumed, Reduced to Beautiful Gray Ashes, and How to Recognize a Demon has Become Your Friend. Her poetry and fiction have appeared in Asimov's, Essence, Doorways, Dark Matter, and received honorable mention in the year's best fantasy and horror. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Linda Addison. Can only be one. Hi. How Hi. you doing, baby? Like one ring, there's only one Linda. <laughs> Addison. <laughs> and, and that one is almost too much to handle it sometimes. Well, it could be, no, depending I, on your age. I, I speak with some authority. <laughs> I, I, I've known you since uh, Ooh. 2000, I guess. Like I said, I like to say I know Brian King before he was Brian King. But you knew me before <laughs> I was me. Yeah, it, uh, the World Horror Con was Denver that year. Oh, and my. you and, and I and some other folks, we stayed at... Uh, Tom Piccarelli and oh, Michelle yeah. Scalise's house. Remember oh, that? Oh boy, fun times, yeah, they, good times. They lived next door to the, the Stanley Hotel, which was, of course, the, the inspiration for the Overlook. That's right. I still China. have the shot glasses I bought there. Yep. <laughs> and then you, you came to that party at my house in oh, 2000. My. You pulled up, opened the car door, and water came flooding out. Ooh, yeah, we kind of floated there. <laughs> you know, and you were you were at my wedding, my second wedding. It was awesome. This and, it was. and my dad still has a crush on you. Fifteen and I years still later, got a warm place waiting for him in my heart. But not for me, not for his son. What's up with that? I told you. <laughs> That's life thing, Brian. Come on. All right. And, and also, we're, we're both Pennsylvania natives. Um, yes. You, know, you grew up in Philly. I um, did. You were the oldest of nine children. Was that a pretty tough childhood? Big time tough. Yeah? Yeah. Was in all the tough neighborhoods and not the best school system. I, I think the only reason I've even, you know, been able to seem intelligent is that I spent most of my childhood reading. Right. And reading does make a difference. Yeah, I love libraries. It was better than my home and my neighborhood. Were you reading speculative fiction early on, or? Well, the, the thing is, like, I, I remember reading. Remember when there were like the Yellow Book of Fables, the Blue Book of Fables. Oh yeah. I read all the fables, fantasies, and then I moved on to science fiction and fantasy once I got older. Yeah. Now, what age did you want to start writing? Ah, there you go. This is interesting. When the first time I was in school, my early memory is holding a book, and it's the book, you know, Jack went up the hill. Right. And I remember holding it, thinking, I want to make these. I want. To, I had no idea what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. I as well said I wanted to make a unicorn. I don't know. I was holding this thing in my hand with pictures and words, thinking I want to do this. I think there's more money in making a unicorn. Actually. No doubts. No doubts at all. So that was my earliest 
vision and then being the oldest of nine and sometimes not always having electricity for TV and radio right. because that was living the great American welfare story, a dream as I like to say. My job was to tell stories and entertain my brothers and sisters because my mom was always pregnant. Yeah. So just seemed like a natural thing to so make that, up stuff. That's what you do? You'd make up stuff and I sure you'd gather did. around and listen? Mm -hmm. Have you ever turned one of those into something as an adult? I haven't. Back and revisited? I haven't. I think a lot of it was what would be, what would a, a 10 year old make up? Like my own versions of uh, stories that I had read. Right. My own versions of fables. Although the closest is I did do Little Red in the Hood, <laughs> which was a takeoff right. of Little Red Riding Hood, which has actually done quite well for me. Right. I've published it in a Barnes and Noble collection, and but it's a very short, weird street version of <laughs> 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 Yeah. So when, when you actually started writing, I mean, did you aspire to do it as a career or was it just no, something man, for personal poor. enjoyment? I, I grew up poor. I knew being an artist was poor. I wasn't going to make that a choice. You had, you had that presence of mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I had enough of that. <laughs> that makes sense. I know you, you started submitting Asimov's when you were in college. Way early. When I have the first 20... Um, issues of Isaac Asimov's magazine. Right. And I had read all of his stuff. I met him um, when I, after college. But as soon as I wrote anything that was close to it, I just wanted to be in Isaac Asimov's magazine so bad. How many uh, rejection letters did you get? Fifteen years, baby. Fifteen years yeah. rejection. I sent everything that was even... Can you curse on your show? Oh yeah, we say... Coop is a co-host. Okay. So. No <laughs> said. Um, I sent anything that was even close to seeming like science fiction. Yeah. No matter what that shit looked like. If it had anything in it, I sent it. And I was just getting form letters and form letters. And then I'd send it somewhere else and I you know, I'd get stuff published. But it always went to Asimov's first. Yeah. And then um, how I got in, you know how I got well, in. Well I, I remember it was uh, it was for the poem the How the Dinosaurs Died, but yeah, listeners don't know this story, so tell the story. So I went to New York as book country in New York, and I was talking to Frederick Pohl. Right. And talking about writing science fiction and this, that, and the other. And he said, every science fiction writer has to write a How the Dinosaurs Died story. <laughs> and I was like, man, okay. So I go home and I write this like 57 word story on how the dinosaurs <laughs> died. That's about as far as I can get. <laughs> and I was in a writer's group, which I still am, Sith, circles in the hair. Right. And I gave it to them and they were like, uh, Linda, this is not a story. This is like more of a poem. And I was like, okay, because I had been sending Asimov stories. Right. Just stories, not Just poems. Stories. So I, I turned it into a poem, took some words out, you know, did some indents, break, line breaks, right. sent it in, got accepted. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and then I, and that was like my dream come true. And then I was in it for like four times and I was like, okay, now I want the New Yorker. Right. <laughs> but the, the key listeners out there, 15 years of rejections before she did that. Yep. So I know, you know. Obviously, then you took off. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, I was getting published in other places. Yeah. It's just that was my dream place, so everything good. went there first. I was with it, Carpe Noctum was that way with me. Mm. Um, Twenty years later, I finally got a story in Carpe Noctum wow. this year. And Mikey Hike is the fiction editor. You would think at some <laughs> point he would have thrown one of his best friends a <sighs> bone, but no. It's all business when it comes down to business. Yes, I'm is. like that too. I can love you to death, but I'm sorry. If it, if it don't work, it don't work. We had Jack Herring on last week's show, or a couple weeks ago, I guess, and uh, you know he's now the president of the board of the Shirley Jackson Awards. Oh, why? You'd think, maybe, oh, why? maybe I'd be up for one, but no, that's not we all happen. We all just doing this like this. <laughs> you know, love until you write something that don't work, and then it's like, whatever. But it's not always business. I mean, there are moments. You were the first African American to win the Bram Stoker Award. That was for consumed, reduced to beautiful gray ashes. Now, I mean, I, I know how. I know what I want to ask. I'm not sure how to phrase it. Um, really, you're gonna be you're gonna be polite with me? No, it's, it's not a matter. Of, it's not a matter. What of, happened? Where did it go wrong? Apparently, he's been drinking. I'm going to do things to you later that are illegal in this state, but. <laughs> I'm so over 21. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I mean, 
I'm not know, sure why not, I'm here. Not only do you win, not only are you the first African American to win, but do you pause and think about the historicness of that? You, it's always going to be referred to. It's you know, you yourself are going to be the first African American. What does that? What does that specifically feel like? Well, you know, um, I first of all, when I first won to Stoker, besides being like blown out of my head because I was on the ballot with people that I admired, right. like I would go and see where Charlie Jacobs published, and that's where I'd send my stuff. You right. know what I'm so how did I beat her? I don't know, uh, and others. Um, I just found out afterwards. I looked on somebody's like, "Oh, you're the first black," and I was like, "No." Yeah. And then I look on the list. I'm like, "Oh." Oh yeah. Um. Now in my 60s, and not that I'm old, but you know what I'm saying. I got old. more behind me than I got in front of me, and there are moments where I think, "What have I really left on this planet besides an awesome son?" Um. And then I think, "Wow, it's not bad." You left that. That's not I bad. mean, that's you know, that's always going to be there. I know it didn't mean it to be. Two hundred years from now, that's still going to be there. And what's so interesting to me is that you know, horror is sort of the ghetto of writing in general, right? right? So I don't really know how much of that is known. And then I'll go to some art thing in New York, and my son and his friends will be there, and one of his friends will come up to me and be like, oh. Adoring me, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> you read? You, you sure? <laughs> Are you sure it's just not because he thinks his his friend's mom is hot? Well, you know, yeah, that could be that part too. of it too. But <laughs> <laughs> my son says but his friends think I'm hot, but they're also quite, you know, ad admiring of that yeah. app. So I guess it it does it does mean something. That, well, I think it does absolutely. I think it means something. Um, your first signing for that book took place at Barnes and Noble at Rockefeller Center on September 11th. Um, I, I'd like you to talk about that day. I mean, were you reluctant to do the signing or were um, you just in shock at that point? The was set up before that September 11th meant anything. Right. And I was working a day job, which I'm not now. And I was in Rockefeller Center. I was working at AXA Financial. Right. I had the book sitting there against my cubicle. I was so excited because the signing was going to be in Rockefeller Center. Right. And then September 11th happened. Right. And the, the whole horror of that's like a whole two hour conversation. Well, exactly. I, I, when we've I put, talked about that. I'm not going to put you through that on the air. When I put the cover down, I put the book down, and I couldn't really look at it for a while. Yeah. The first poem is called Firefight. Right. Which you read that night, correct? I did. I didn't do. Oh, you did. You didn't do it. No, okay. the city shut down. All right. And the first time I read it was on a cable show a couple months later, and it was still shaking, and yeah. people were like outraged. And I'd written that poem two years before. Did they think you'd written it yeah. about September 11th? I was like, it was just two years old. Yeah. But it was really startling. Yeah. It was a startling thing. It's a hell of a debut for sure. Cool. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I could have done the yeah. signing. I was so shook, sure, but the city totally shut down. Yeah. I just about had to walk back to the bars. Yeah. So I didn't even come back in the city for a week, and then there was the whole smell coming up from right. down there. And, you know. Right. Well, your third collection, Being Full of Light, Insubstantial. Um, I don't know how deep you want to get into this, but I, I know that was inspired, at least partially, by your, your mom's struggle with Alzheimer's. For sure. Um, do you want to talk about that at all? Well, I can talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, there, you know, we all search for meaning in life and how to handle things, you know. And up and, and I did Tai Chi, I do meditation. When the Alzheimer's hit with my mom, I was always trying to be very present with her. Right. And so for her, it got down to the point where she was like one sentence. Like by the time you got to the end of a sentence with her, it was gone. And so the concept of being present and now really became a real different thing for me. <laughs> and so I was writing that book. I wanted to write 100 poems because I, my other collections had been like 30 or 40 poems. So I was really intent on doing 100 poems. It was such a struggle. Right. 
such a struggle, but I was determined. Yeah. Really pushing myself into the game. And you did it. I did. What what do you And prefer? it won a stoker. It did. It did. It did. The fourth. That was your third. fourth. Was that your third? What yeah. was the fourth? Four elements. That's right, that's right. It's been a long weekend. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean, what do you prefer writing? Poetry or prose? Well, poetry is just like constantly going through my head all the time. Yeah. I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you, poetry is going through my You're head. You're writing a poem about me right now. I can now. write a poem about anything at any time. Yeah. I could be Harlan Ellison in the shop window writing. <laughs> I mean, I could just do it. So it's sort of genetically... <laughs> I have to say, you're much better looking than Harlan Ellison. <laughs> I like his hair, though. I think it's pretty Is it real? Yes, it is, yeah. I've had my hand in okay, it. Okay, Harlan, I, I don't want you suing us or threatening to sue us. It's a genuine question. Right. Just, and Harlan, I'm, you know, the black girl with the dragon. I'm the one that's always playing with your hair. That's me. <laughs> Actually, Harlan, it's me. She's just taking the bullet for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so poetry's always in me. Yeah. And then stories started to occur, and now novels. I'm working on my first Novel. That was my next question for you. What are you working on next? Are you ever going to do a full-length novel? So. I'm in the middle of beginning a science fiction novel series. No kidding. Yeah, shoot me now. <laughs> That's the title, or is that a request? <laughs> it's a request. <laughs> because I, there are days I wake up and go, why? Yeah. Why am I doing this? I, I can do poetry well. What happened? Where did it go wrong? And it's just, I've avoided it for years because yeah. I was terrified. I thought I'd get lost in a book and never write. And so I did all this other stuff and, you know, did well. I've always over 300 things in print. And then I just had to do the novel. I couldn't. It, it would wake me up in the middle of the night, the characters. And yeah. I said, okay. So no poetry collections for a while. You've got to go where the, where the muse dictates. And I can't, I can't tell you how this is going to work. Yeah. If you were saying, like, how's the next poem poetry collection? I'd be like, ah, it's going to kick ass because I love my poetry. Yeah. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm I'm the same spot. I, I have a novel due at the the end of July called The Complex, and I haven't worked on it in two weeks. It's not finished, and I haven't worked on it in two weeks because my muse is demanding I write this novella that is is basically me working out my anger over the fact that two of my best friends have passed away in the last mm, six months. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And you know, I know you're right there with me, and, and we don't need to get into all that, uh, but. Yeah, you, you have to do what the muse dictates. And well, the thing is, Brian, you know you can write a novel. Well, exactly. I, on the other hand, I can't this write a is poem. An experiment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Every all the writers I know are like, oh, you can do it. And I was like, really? Well, how you know that? <laughs> I know you can do it. Would you like how to you know, know why? That? Yes. Would you like to know why? Um, first of all, let's take a look at your short fiction. Okay, the way it's plotted, the way it's structured. Okay, it's it's like little novel chapters. Each of your short I predict that when you when this novel here starts to take shape, every chapter will read like a short story. Well let me tell you a little bit about that. It's interesting that you say that. I when I won my third Stoker, I had a conversation with Rick Bartolo. Right. And Joe Lansdale, the king. Oh yes. For some reason, the two kings sat me down in the corner <laughs> and were talking to me, and they were like, so, uh, Linda, thinking about doing anything longer? And I was like, oh, yeah, novels, but I'm really scared. I'm scared. And Joe said, well, you do short stories just fine, and you just do each chapter like a short story, and literally... Like someone snapped their finger, the fear left me. Yep. And that's how I'm writing this novel. That's all it takes. And that's why I know you can do this novel. The other thing is, you're fearless. You're fucking fearless. I mean, well, you were crazy. Yeah. You, yeah. Crazy well, fearless. I was, I was <laughs> trying to be polite. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'll cut somebody. I'll no cut question. Somebody. So, yeah, I cut absolutely. I, well, not mine personally. Oh, no. Because you know how to act. Uh, <laughs> some people I may be in trouble. <laughs> Look no, out, man. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I know. No, no I, I have no doubt in my mind you can do this. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I agree with him. We'll I'm 100. I'm totally agree with what I, he's saying. I'm yeah. appreciative of the support. Let's see how this works. All right. Well, until then, where can folks find you online, Linda? Um. Oh, my books are on Amazon in the Nook. Right, and that's Linda Addison, A D D I S O N. Correct, and my site is 
Linda Addison poet because Linda Addison was already owned by uh, a lawyer. Yeah, an attorney. <laughs> yes. And her and I are always coming up in each other's Google lists. <laughs> Have you ever been contacted by her? No, no, but I think it would be a star. That would be funny. <laughs> All right. Well, Linda, thank you so much for sitting down with us, taking time. Um, I know it's been a long, crazy weekend here for us. Pleasure. Uh, you go get yourself some sleep. Yeah. And Dave, I'm going to let you uh, close up shop here. I'm going to make sure Linda makes it back to her room, okay? Okay, sure. Right. Love you both. Okay. Love you more. Okay. My joy. <laughs> Okay, and we're back, and we are still uh, meth head free. So let's try to wrap this up before they return. I, I have something I, I, I want to ask or just mention. I, I don't think we're gonna have a discussion about it, but uh, I finished watching Mr. Robot. I did too. Yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily like the way it ended. Now I'm not gonna get into to spoilers or anything because I don't think a lot of people have watched it yet. But I kind of felt like the story was headed in a direction. And it kind of shifted a little bit because I thought originally the show was only supposed to be one season. Oh, no. Wasn't it? No. Okay, so it was always meant to be multiple seasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wasn't quite pleased with the ending, but I, I was very entertained by it. So I loved it. I mean, you know, politically, it spoke to well, me. Well, yeah, it's, it's, um, it did me too because I, you know, yeah. we, we agree on a lot of stuff. Not everything, but um, but uh, it, it was entertaining, but I think the beginning part I liked a little bit better than the end but you know still it was entertaining right so, you didn't like the whole fight club twist um I saw that coming a mile away okay personally. um I wasn't sure which way they were going to go with that but in the first episode or the second I remember saying to Phoebe is this is fight club redone <laughs> <laughs> which it's not but they kind of it's not I mean it borrows like, from the matrix it borrows it, from fight club it borrows from a lot of different stuff it's it's one of the best things on TV, certainly probably the best thing that's ever been on USA Network. Absolutely. You know, considering what they normally show on that channel. Um, but I just, I thought the ending, I thought it could have been a little bit better, but we'll see what happens in season two. Yeah. I did finish watching that, so I just wanted to mention it. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the hell we out of it. about it a couple weeks ago. Um, so. All right. That's, that's the only thing I've, I've watched, because I was away uh, drinking and eating, so. <laughs> and watching Metal Bands. <laughs> All right, well, one more time, thanks to this week's sponsor, Influence of Anxiety, a new exhibit at Brown University's John Hay Library in Providence, Rhode Island. This exhibition focuses on correspondence between H.P. Lovecraft and a number of budding young authors, including Robert Block. Uh, it runs from now until January 8th, and for more information, you can visit library.brown.edu. And I would just like to point out, Dave, we've got Brown University sponsoring the fucking show uh, it's impressive who does three guys with a beard have sponsoring I, theirs I, I can only imagine <laughs> psychologists therapists uh how people listen to it so somebody pointed out you did not you did a solo show last week you did not make fun of three guys with a beard so i had to make sure there's lots of making fun of them today. well there we to go yeah there we go yes. all right and if there's someone you want us to make fun of or something you want us to talk about <laughs> Hit us up on our Twitter page, our Facebook page, or our website, uh, which is thehorrorshowwithbriankeen.com. I want to point out quickly, our Facebook page is nearing 500 likes. Ooh. So, well, it's only been up like four weeks. That's pretty like good. That. Yeah. No, it's great. So if you know somebody who hasn't liked it yet or you introduce the show, the best thing you can do as a listener is to pass along our show to other people to get more people listening. So, uh, you know, do that if you can. Yeah. 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 Uh, next week, next week, an interview with musician and electronica artist Xander Harris, which, you know, again, we were, we were now Xander, he's connected to the horror genre. He's a huge fan. Um, some of album. some of his albums are based on horror properties. For example, his album Urban Gothic is based on a novel by moi. Yes, exactly. um, but, you know, he's he's known in in music circles, especially electronic music. And as I said, we, we want to expand the audience. So we thought it'd be a good idea to have him on. But uh, after today's, what, three appearances by by the kids next door? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If anybody listens after this, I'm going to be stunned. So uh, we should 
we should do is get that kid uh, Kelly Owens address. We should hang out over there. Oh, record her show. Yeah, Buttercup of Doom, yes. her podcast, and, and ask her about Corn and Zoom. <laughs> I would like to point out that the horror show Buttercup of Doom, Three Guys with Beards, and all the other Project I Radio shows are available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, and all other platforms. And you can visit Project I Radio online at projectiradio.com to advertise on the horror show. Contact Jess, J-E-S-S, at projectiradio.com. And Dave, until next week, always remember to have a pitcher wa- pitcher of water there next to the toilet in case you need to flush it. Okay, yeah. That's, that's some advice that I can't live without. I also say kids, 